let's talk about power. Um, power has many dimensions, so we're three very different people, three very different backgrounds around the table. So let's start with a brief introduction. My name is Sven Biskop. I'm Belgian. I'm also Belgian-based in Brussels. I wear two hats. I'm a professor at the University of Ghent, and I'm a director of research at a think tank, the Royal Institute for International Relations, Egmont, in Brussels. And I deal with two big topics, defense, so really the most classic dimension of power, if you want. Um, and then I deal with relations between the great powers, you know, how to position Europe, the European Union, in the power games between China, Russia and the United States. And then of course that game has a military dimension, but also an economic dimension and a political dimension. Thank you. My name is Sarah Kavipur. I am a, a lawyer by training. Uh, I had uh, uh, built my expertise in, uh, in the public sector for, for some years in different ministries. Uh, I moved then to the private sector where I consolidated this expertise by working in banks, um, more in the regulatory environment of, of finance. And today I'm an independent director. I sit on different boards of different banks and I also advise banks. So. I'm coming from the financial sector. My name is uh, Geert Loving. I'm a media theorist, um, internet critic and activist. And um, I uh, run a small research unit in uh, Polytech, uh, Amsterdam's uh, Hochschool, uh, the Havia. And uh, there I'm uh, leading the Institute of Network Cultures. And I'm doing that since uh, 2004, and um, I have a background in um, in the squatters movement, in uh, mini <coughs> media arts, um, internet uh, activism, and um, yeah, I'm still uh, you know here in the museum. I'm at home because uh, I'm very closely tied to uh, you know the concerns of uh, artists and. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time uh, working with artists in my center. All right. Now, maybe to kick us off, I was thinking that many people, in my view, they hear power and they, they immediately attach negative connotations to it. Um, maybe especially, uh, you know, our audience, who knows, you know, people are interested in the arts. I have a more optimist, optimist, positive view of it. And I think our problem as Europeans is rather that we, we have stopped to think about power and we have forgotten a bit what power is and how to use it. Because we always think, ah, oh, somebody who is powerful, they begin to beat up their neighbors. Uh, you know, a powerful country, then the first project is and always, you know, let's invade our neighbors, let's let's annex a province, a province or two. Um, but my view is rather, um, that you need power also if you want to implement a positive project. Um, I always like to quote the notion of realpolitik. You know, it's another notion everybody immediately thinks, oh, Bismarck, Kissinger, uh, the end justifies the means. But, but the original meaning of the concept is a very positive one. The guy who invented it, the German obviously, Ludwig von Rotten, he was a liberal. In 1948, there was a failed revolution. Failure to create democracy. He was involved in that, and afterwards he wrote a book about realpolitik. And he said, Look, we have beautiful values, but dreaming about them, just dreaming about them, serves no purpose. You need power. And if you have power, then you can bring them into practice. If not, there will always be an illusion. So, for me, this is the challenge that I see for us Europeans is to, to understand that we need power in all dimensions, classic military power also, just in case, certainly economic power, that includes technology, um, certainly also political political influence, and we need that power first of all to safeguard our own way of life, it's maybe a very American term, let's say the type of society that we have chosen to build, we need to preserve it and, and improve it, that requires power, um, and we need power even to pursue a constructive project for the world. Because you cannot say from a position of weakness to a big power like China, I'm going to work with you. Because 
then then the risk is very high that you will exploit them. So even if you want to engage other powers in the world, you need to be a power yourself. That's sort of my uh, my starting point in in all of those um, dimensions. But perhaps. Um, my two uh, co-conspirators here in the basement have already widely different opinions on that. Yeah, I want to uh, say something about, uh, you know, the, let's say, historic trauma of power. Because uh, in Europe, uh, when we're talking about power, and many you know, would uh, say that in our generation, uh, Roughly speaking, you know, after the war, huh? uh, and th there is a trauma of uh, power, hmm? and um, I think um, I come from a generation that uh, clearly uh, put uh, it uh, as its task to dismantle power, to question the power, to locate it, to see precisely where it is how it's, for instance, functioning within people, in relationship between genders, uh, race, um, to put it in a you know, colonial and post-colonial perspective, and uh, to fight the power, <laughs> let's say, <laughs> you know, to use the term. And yeah, this is very much uh, connected, I believe, to Michel Foucault, uh, you know, uh, and uh, he wrote in the in the 70s uh, particularly and uh, I think his writings and his thinking about power uh, is very very multi-layered and um, yeah it's something that uh, you know I I grew up with or grew into and this whole idea of the European power uh, of course was is something that uh, uh, very many many people uh, you know, wanted to question uh, because uh, uh, the relation between Europe and power has been pretty uh, disastrous, uh, in the especially you know, 18, 19, 20th century, uh, or you know, coming from the Netherlands, uh, maybe even you know, the 17th century for that matter. Mm. Uh, so, um, yeah, my generation um, put it to task to uh, not end the power, because if you read Foucault, you will see that uh, power will always be generated and there are always new and different power relations. So it's a naive idea to think that you can do away with it. But uh, what we can do, especially as Europeans, I think, um, is to analyze it, to point at it, to, uh, and maybe, you know, this is navel gazing and this, uh, you know, uh, puts us in the situation that you uh, just um, uh, mentioned, but uh, this is probably you know what's uh, up for debate this afternoon here in the Mudam Sela. <laughs> yes, this is all quite fascinating. I've been thinking about how this concept of power would relate to the financial world, and if I look at what happened in uh, in Europe, but then in the world also since 2009. You know, one, one can look at power from, from different points of view. So power as a force, as a force in society, and in this particular context, deregulation of finance. So in a certain sense, an abuse of power, because a, a certain force got out of hand and started to, to affect other, other uh, aspects of life. Then power also in the sense of abuse of power, but then also of powerlessness. So I, I think it's in interesting to, to look at also this financial crisis as a dialectic of, of these three dimensions of power and then to think of how this dialectic then relates to the different protagonists in society. Who are the protagonists? There are the individuals, the institutions, and then the community or the collective. And how did this, let's say, dialectic of power affect these three protagonists in society? And if you now take for instance a definition that um, uh, that, that that you uh, were alluding to in, in in your presentation at first when you say people associate something negative with power then you would think of people being in positions of power just 
deciding things, just doing things. Are they legitimate or not? Uh, does it make sense or not? And of course, for, for many, many years, uh, there were a lot of meetings in Brussels, there were meetings all over the world to understand how one can move from a deregulated uh, environment to a regulated environment again. And a lot of power was used to do that. Um, it, it's interesting then to think of what we have today in terms of a framework that was put in place, whether it was the consequence of power or of powerlessness. This honestly is not very clear to me yet. The only thing that, that I really draw from this experience is that in order for power to be meaningful and to actually lead to a constructive result, it needs to be framed. It needs to be channeled and it needs to have a value system that, that it, it obeys. Because it's when it leaves that moral framework that, that power then becomes actually a negative source in so society rather than a positive source in society. So maybe at a more conceptual level, this is probably true for all the forces in society, not just in the financial sector, but it is something that looking at what happened since 2009, I could clearly see in different, in different moments of this crisis as it was unfolding, but then also, and to some extent, there is still an aftermath of the crisis that we're still experiencing, uh, how this concept has been building up and, and, and implemented. It's very interesting what you say. I mean, I would say uh, you, need, you need a project, you know, that mm -hmm. and, and power is then the tool to to achieve to achieve that project, and that project can be very positive. Your project can be to build a welfare state, for example, but that requires power also, right? But of course, others have a, um, can have a negative project uh, as well. Um, as you say, the deregulation I find very interesting is a project of some players. Clearly, some states have you know old-fashioned type project or what we regard as old-fashioned of of creating spheres of influence and 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 dominating um, dominating other other countries. I think my feeling is why m many in Europe immediately look at power as something so negative, because we have of course made an honest attempt, as you said here, to overcome. Um, war among ourselves and to make sure that within our community, the European Union, we do not use power directly against each other anymore. And we've, um, we've created what in, in academic terms we call a security community. Any dispute, any difference is settled through legal means and, and by peaceful means. And, 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 and we have tried to make it unimaginable that you would use force against one another. Um, and also practically impossible. It's one market, and for most of it's one currency, so it's difficult to attack another country if they fall under the same European Central Bank somehow. But I think what we often forget is that the rest of the world is not like that. And for a long time we thought, you know, just it's sufficient that we, the EU, we are what we are, and the others, they are also rational people, they will look at this and they will say, oh yes, this is the way ahead will move in the same direction. But they haven't, of course, because their circumstances are different. And so sadly, in the world around us, yeah, there are still players who use power also very aggressively. And so I think we have to balance the two, our own model, but which you can't just transplant to another place of the world. So we must also have, in a way, the power at least to defend uh, ourselves, to deal with that, yeah, with, with that other part of the world. Would you maybe s say something about, you know, your personal uh, encounters? Because of us three, you probably came closest to, to the traditional political power because you worked in a ministry. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I did work in the Ministry of Finance from 2009, in fact, mm. until here 2014, in yes, mm -hmm. here in Luxembourg. So it was really the beginning of the financial crisis and, I, and uh, I, I had the opportunity to work closely also with the Minister of Finance then. It was very interesting to, to see how when you are put in a position uh, of, of challenges, of a crisis, um, how power then becomes actually something that is very connected with responsibility because you, 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 need to, you need to really take in charge 
a process that is affecting society at large, that is actually questioning the functioning of society. I mean, when we think back about uh, the bank runs, uh, how, how this whole question of, of, of do we let banks that are of systemic uh, nature fail or not, how that really affected also the morale in society, there was a huge responsibility that policymakers had to take on at that, at that point, and also in a moment um, of... of, of um some panic, you know, it, it is not a, a moment where you can actually say, well, we will take time and, and, and profoundly uh, think about this matter and decide. So there was also the markets that were pressuring. So how do you then use that power in a context that is not ideal to make the best decisions for, um, for, for that time? So it was interesting to see how then policymakers deal with that. Because then power, as I said, is responsibility, it's pressure, often it's also fear. Uh, but then you have some that deal with it in a more humble way than others. Uh, some become personally attached to it, others <laughs> don't. So, so that personal dimension then also comes into play and affects the quality of that decision-making process. And, uh, and, and for having been part of, of, of many meetings where, where policy makers would meet, it was very interesting to see that one discussions uh, took place in a certain uh, context, environment, with certain attitudes, the decisions that came out, you know, were obviously impacted by, by, by that mindset. I mean, you remember how, how Greece was, was affected, how, how the Spanish uh, financial sector, the Irish, uh, Portugal, etc. So all of these were very personal, very emotional uh, discussions, where policymakers had to really, to some extent, have a discipline not to let their personal um, yeah, bias affect the use of power that they were elected to represent in at, at that moment. And everyone deals with it in an extremely different way. Although there was also a risk of the opposite at the time, I think that it would become a purely technocratic mm -hmm. exercise. And I remember debates about how far can you go to force a state like Greece to, to cut back on its social welfare, for example, because I remember writing at that time a paper saying, yeah, there's no point in saving the euro <coughs> at the price of destroying the welfare state, because the euro is not an objective in its own right. The welfare state is, in my view. So if you have to destroy it in order to save it, you know, that, that's like Vietnam. In order to save the village from communism, we bombed it into the earth. Mm, yeah, perhaps not. So um, I, I found that at the time very, very tricky. It linked back, uh, Sarah, to what you said about... Uh, the moral framework, in, in my view, or, or the project. They have mm -hmm. to know very well, well, what is the actual objective here? Right? There's no point saving only the banking system mm -hmm. if you, if the price is you destroy the buying power, to use the word power again, of, of every individual uh, citizen. But it's also linked, w one more word, to, to the, my geopolitical take, because that's also the year 2007-8 uh, financial crisis to which you can date the breakthrough of China as a great power. Since then, indisputably, mm -hmm. China is again a great power. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, just to build on what you said, um, uh, this question of power also had an other dimension that I found very interesting to observe is that, I mean, one says money is power, but I could literally see it happen. So a country starts to lose power because it is losing its money. And somehow that then also made it lose its voice. And, and how is that working out, in an especially in the context of the European Union? At some point we were just talking about Greece, not with Greece anymore. You know, no. and, and, and so, so we took that power away because we felt that Greece owes us. And I was always wondering what that is actually right. You know, I, is, the, is that correlation that we created, are these consequences, are they morally right? Just a question. Can you maybe go more in detail? Can you tell something about, you know, did uh, banks, for instance, or investment funds go bankrupt in Luxembourg at the time, in those years? Or was it just a, a threat from outside? So Luxembourg, uh, back in the day, decided to intervene. The government uh, did uh, rescue um, rescue one or the other bank. Uh, 
uh, except in one very specific case, which also was not of systemic nature, um, there were it was feared that it could have a larger impact. The government did intervene. But that question was open for every country to decide. And we also know from other countries that other decisions were taken. So that question of at what point do you intervene uh, and, and let also some events you know, go their course, natural course of, of um, let's say, construction, deconstruction, um, was also interesting to see how far do you use that power to, to prevent uh, uh, certain things from happening. Um, in Luxembourg, in any case, the government or policymakers decided that it was in the national interest not to not to let uh, certain consequences unfold. But we know that this was not the case in, in all the countries. Yeah. Were they um, these interventions followed by a policy of uh, long-term austerity, like in many other countries, or how how, how did that work out? So during that time in Luxembourg. Uh, I would not say austerity, but there was mm -hmm. definitely a policy of budgetary discipline um, where um, it, there was a prudent uh, uh, policy that was adopted, but it was also a policy that was going beyond just budgetary measures, but also trying to redefine a model for the financial sector. And I think this is a reflection that many other financial sectors were also engaged in. What is the place of finance uh, uh, in, in, in a world that is growing out of this financial sector and also in a very regulated environment. I think this is something that we still are trying to adjust to. Uh, ever since the crisis, we also have a European framework that is extremely dense. I would say that has a lot of power. Uh, uh, and, and some would even say, uh, is it legitimate or not? Because um, we all know that th these institutions are not elected institutions. So I think you, c you, can, you can really go into, into some detail here to see what are the consequences of this crisis that in fact has created an infrastructure that is m huge mm. and, and powerful in Europe. I found it quite surprising at the time that one could even talk of the possibility of, for example, Greece being pushed out of the Eurozone, because in my view, the EU is, is not just an organization. It's a state-like organization. It's somewhere in between an organization that you can join, but also leave again, and a state. In a state, you don't just join and leave, not, not just like that, you know, as, as the UK has now, now found out. So I think in many ways, I mean, my country, Belgium, in many ways, we're a province of the EU, of the single market, of the Eurozone. We're a province of it. And you implement what's decided at the central, uh, at the central level. You know? So, I mean, no American would conceive that as a result of the financial crisis, you would have to push Texas out of the Union, right? So that we conceived of pushing Greece out, I found very, very disturbing in a way, because my, my desired end state is the United States of Europe. Also, because in my view, that's the only way to aggregate power at, at, at in sufficient strength is at the central level, not in every field. But if you have to hold our own in a world of intense competition between China, Russia, the US, uh, if you have to hold our own in a technological race, in an economic race, then I think we need to centralize in, in some areas much more than we do. So how does the internet play all in into all this? Um, yeah, there is a there is a fintech uh, mm -hmm. turn, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I've been uh, very much a part of that since um, 2013. We uh, we have an international network uh, called Money Lab, and um, uh, these are a lot of um, around let's say 800 or 1,000 uh, artists around the globe who, uh, you know, work on, uh, on these uh, uh, issues. So um, it's a network of uh, investigative journalists, researchers, uh, artists, uh, but also um, activists. And um, yeah, the financialization or the monetization uh, of the Internet uh, is in our circles seen as a, a very good thing. First of all, it radically breaks mm -hmm. with the dogma of uh, Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, sorted out a very uh, sneaky uh, business model for itself, namely to give uh, uh, away all the services for free and mm -hmm. in exchange, uh, you know, get um, uh, get your data behind your back, right? 
and th this uh, this uh, what we call you know uh, economy of the free uh, luckily uh, is now slowly uh, coming uh, to an end it took really long time and a lot of people are still hooked uh, you know to the social media and um, uh, that's uh, that's still a case but um, let's say the the financialization or monetization mm -hmm. um, of the internet is in general considered as a very good and radical answer uh, to break the, the power of uh, S Silicon Valley. Also because they are not at all involved. They were asleep. They are still defending their, si their, mo their monetary uh, system, the old model. Uh, so they are not at all uh, involved in the new uh, solutions. Can you give a concrete uh, example here of what that means? What it means? Uh, yeah, a concrete example of the monetization. Yeah, well, you know, but also just go to China. <laughs> yeah. I go to China and look at uh, how, uh, how uh, you know, the platforms there are fully uh, monetized and uh, people can, uh, can trade, they can sell goods and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a fully functioning um, uh, payment system uh, which the Americans have always blocked and are still blocking to this uh, to this day and that is also the explanation let's say why uh, since uh, let's say 2009 10 coinciding uh, with uh, the, l the last mm -hmm. uh, financial crisis uh, Bitcoin uh, grew so rapidly uh, and uh, the whole uh, crypto blockchain um, developed more or less as a, a completely parallel uh, system, uh, primarily because mm. uh, Silicon Valley refused uh, to uh, implement it, and they d they refuse it up to uh, today, right? So today we have uh, a, a system that is uh, completely free, uh, which is ad based, mm? and we have this very strange, uh, yeah, what I call right wing populist uh, crypto dream. Uh, which is uh, primarily, uh, you know, against the state, against uh, not only the, the the state banks and their fiat uh, money, but uh, it's also uh, against the the traditional uh, banks. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, this whole crypto thing is not uh, uh, going into a direction um, uh, that uh, you know is now implemented in China. So China is, uh, you know, really way ahead in this uh, sense that um, um, we in the West have this, this kind of dual uh, system of an, of an internet that is free and kind of half-hearted attempts to implement some uh, payment uh, systems mm? Mm. in which some banks are involved but the traditional banks are also very uh, you know, cautious and they don't really want, uh, they want to keep control uh, in the back, there are of course the uh, the American credit card uh, uh, companies that uh, also don't want any peer-to-peer -peer payment uh, systems uh, to be implemented. So on the west side, uh, uh, it, it's a very very um, chaotic uh, uh, picture. Whereas uh, you know, if you look at uh, uh, the way that, for instance, in China, uh, these pl platforms are implemented, there's a, m a much more integrated uh, idea. Now, I'm not saying uh, that, um, you know, it's going there uh, uh, like uh, Hunky Dory uh, that uh, the, the um, uh, Communist uh, Party is now intervening and it's intervening precisely at, uh, at, uh, at the level uh, that, uh, you know, it's, it's caused by this uh, venture capital backed American system in which mm. systems grow very, very fast and you create monopolies and very, very rich, uh, you know, founders and very, very small group of ultra rich uh, people. And uh, yeah, China, the Communist Party is now trying to do away uh, with that uh, kind of very speculative uh, monopoly uh, side. But in general, we see that um, in China, um, uh, let's say ordinary people uh, have much much more possibilities uh, to um, to set up uh, you know their own e-commerce uh, and payment systems, whereas here uh, in the West it's still very much uh, in the hands of traditional banks. Mm. For, for me, it, it somehow makes me think that still the natural 
incumbent of power is the state and that in the end that's the only that's still the most legitimate actor and if it acts it can really wield its power because we often hear you all well but the big um, IT giant and so on they they are replacing the state the internet has democratized power but I don't buy that I think for example the Google's and the Microsoft they become very powerful because we've let them but if the state says tomorrow it's finished we can do that but we but we or some um, policy makers just don't just don't want it but for me the state it's still a world of of states and I think uh, it will be for a long time to come and even in the cyber world it's the mo most powerful states that will the most power in the cyber sphere logically because you need resources also to develop that but you oh sorry no I'm just thinking you know and listening to, to the two of you and, and trying to put it also again in a context of how our understanding of power has maybe evolved over the past you know, centuries to some extent I, it seems that we think of the power system of always suggesting that there is a hierarchy of the powerful and then there is uh, those who have no power so basically uh, you know there are different categories but even within those that have power there are differences there are mm. those that have more power than others and I'm trying to think whether at this point also in, in, in society, whether we don't need to rethink completely and profoundly this way of organizing society. You know, what would a world look like where nation states actually have, you know, equal power in the sense that they are equal peers? Where the point is not to compete against each other, but to work together towards something common. You know, what would, what would happen to the concept of power if we would think of the world like that? Or even, you know, among people, wha when where it is less about having power over something or somebody, but it's more about empowerment. Or power too. Or power too. And, 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 and maybe it's, it's, it's <coughs> important, of course, we observe things and, and, and we conceptualize them, but then also how are we trying to rethink the system? Because we also see that it's not a perfect system. It is a very dysfunctional system. And then why is it that society today is starting to think like that? And why didn't they think of it 500 years ago? You know, what has changed today? What is in our awareness different? And also our level of maturity. And, and, and it, it starts, let's say, in the family, where we have children today that challenge, if to some extent, the power or the authority of parents because they want to be treated differently. Now, 500 years ago, that probably wasn't the case. So also to look at, to look at, at, at how, how is society at large maturing and how is this maturity affecting the way we look at concepts that have always been there have always been implemented in a certain way and is that way today still valid somehow i i doubt that there will be any great change because we're not in a greek city state anymore you know where you can say at that time well every male citizen which excludes a lot of people well half of people already all the women but also the non-citizens okay you could bring them together physically and and discuss everything if you wanted but i think you know representative democracy um you know i'm with churchill you know it's it's the worst system except for all the others um because i i don't think it's you cannot you cannot be strategic if you have to um at any moment decide everything with everybody then then you're always then you you go for you end up in ad hocery i think that's that's my that's my fear then so again if you need to have power also requires consistency and the sort of confidence okay i have a certain i have a, a certain amount of time to develop my project if whatever i decide can be revoked because tomorrow someone calls a referendum then nobody can ever get anything done so you build in breaks into the system right in our system it's the elections every four or five years some dictatorships managed to organize that too right in the chinese system until now they had discovered a way because every every dictatorship struggles with the same problem the succession right if putin has a heart attack this afternoon who will be a successor nobody knows maybe they have a guy there hiding behind the curtains but we don't know for we know there'll be a huge succession crisis and chinese had a system they said two terms and your, your second term we prepare the next one 
Xi Jinping is now breaking through that by, by going, going for a third term. But that also was, was a break. Even in an authoritarian system, you know that power, you have a finite amount of, finite amount of time to, uh, to use it. So still, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of um, referenda, the Vox Populi, all kinds of direct democracy. I, I think it's, it, it sounds nice, but to me it stops you from actually exercising power. Also exercising it for the good. Just to clarify, this is not what I was suggesting. Yeah, yeah. I was not suggesting direct, direct democracy. I was just su suggesting at a s at a level of system yeah. to have to think of the possibility of what a world would look like where the U.S., China, Russia, and the rest of the world would actually a little bit like it was thought of at uh, in the European Union speak uh, at level playing field equal footing. What, what would happen to that world where the, the and, and it has nothing to do with demo democracy as such. Mm. I mean, you we're talking about legitimate governance here, but what would happen to the, to, to, to the order also in the world, to the way uh, 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 countries would interact with each other and then therefore also the, the people in these countries, if it was less about fighting each other, but more about working together towards a common cause. And, and if you think of, of power being something like this, it becomes a very positive yeah. thing. It, it looks, I mean, this leads us back in to the concert of powers that we had in the 19th century. You know, after the defeat of Napoleon, Congress of Vienna, the powers sort of organized a system for Europe. And of course, those same powers then all developed an imperialist project I mean, to control the rest of the world, but for to an extent, it worked within Europe. But again, it, it meant, of course, that those few great powers, five, six, they decided the fates of the smaller states, right? And Belgium separated from the Netherlands. They, it was up to them. They decided we accept it or we don't. It was not up to the Dutch or the Belgians in the end. Um, what I think we could achieve today, when we have, for the moment, four big global players, China, Russia, US, EU, is a concert of powers, but embedded within strong multilateral institutions. Mm -hmm. So the, the great powers, they have to take the lead because they have the scale to do that, but, but working also for the others, not just deciding over the others, but working with the others mm -hmm. within the multilateral system. I think that's the best we can hope for in the current, in the current setup. And I would say, I, I always distinguish between competition and rivalry. I think competition between states is inevitable, just like in the economy. Um, if I open a supermarket on one corner of the street, I'm competing with, with you if you open on the other corner of the street, but it doesn't mean we're enemies. So a state, you know, every state is looking for uh, export markets, for natural resources, for influence. Uh, it doesn't mean that the other state is also looking to increase its export is your enemy because sometimes your interests overlap and you, so you compete, you cooperate at the same time. But rivalry is something else. That means that I decide not only to, to defend my interests, but that I actively try to undermine yours on purpose. And that, that's something that we ought to try to abstain from um, because that, that's, that's pure negative power, right? Mm. Um, and I think what we are missing a bit on the you know, Europeans and certainly Americans is is our positive project, right? I think far often the Americans say, well, we're not China, we're against China, so you have to be with us. And other countries say, yeah, but China has a lot to offer, a Belt and Road Initiative, investment, so there's an offer on the table. You're against China, okay, but what's your offer for us? What's your positive project? Um, but, it, and it, but it's very easy to fall into this you know, Cold War rhetoric of, of us against them, and then you don't get that cooperation or that concert. Yeah, I don't believe in competition. Uh, it, it's simply not happening on the internet. <laughs> and it's a mm. classic example why uh, this neoliberal idea of competition uh, and the market, uh, you know, is simply not uh, there. So uh, we have uh, near monopolies uh, that uh, once you are inside that monopoly, you can open your shop and you, you can open yours, mm. but you do that inside Amazon, right? So um, and so this is uh, not a yep. market, and uh, the internet has not fostered any any market, right? Uh, so in that sense, um, 
yeah the, the competition uh, is uh, is in fact uh, completely uh, uh, absent and uh, the economies of scale are such that um, uh, it uh, constantly creates let's say new uh, uh, monopolies um, and okay so yeah there is this kind of strange uh, uh, competition also within us within my generation within the people who build up the internet between this dream of the decentralized uh, distributed nature of the networks and the ugly uh, reality of platform capitalism in which uh, you know there are only very very few uh, monopoly players uh, which uh, then uh, you know decide uh, inside uh, that platform uh, your fate uh, if your small shop is uh, is going to uh, is going to make it uh, or not um, so this is kind of the, the 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 what I call platform realism uh, so this is kind of uh, uh, maybe the um, real politic mm. if you like um, versus um, you know the idealists that uh, hang on to this uh, this original idea that uh, you know there might be a, a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer, uh, possibilities in which uh, also we can uh, redistribute uh, the wealth uh, that um, is uh, is created right and that position yeah is is in fact uh, becoming weaker and weaker and um, in fact there is n at that level there's no concept anymore about counter power right there is this idea is simply not uh, existing anymore right so in the in the in the times when uh, the uh, uh, when labor and the working class was uh, fighting the you know the uh, industrialists, the rubber barons and uh, the bourgeoisie, there was a very clear idea of organization, uh, social organization and uh, this idea of course has completely faded away uh, in the 60s and then uh, after 68 and uh, the trauma of 68, <coughs> especially in the 70s, right? And this is where my uh, generation comes in, that uh, we only see uh, f a f kind of a fading away of the notion of a of a vital counter power in society right mm. if we are thinking today if i'm honest in europe but also in on the level of the nation states about counter power we primarily think of populist national uh, right wing um, you know xenophobic movements and uh, they in europe they are the only, uh, let's say, real uh, counterpower uh, that we have seen over the last uh, 10, uh, 20 years. But do you think the state itself could be that counterpower in Europe, I mean, to break well, some of the Well, the, the issue is uh, the, st the state has withdrawn in on, on so many levels, right? Mm. And given all its um, vital functions to, to the market and... Uh, to reintroduce a notion of the uh, state, yeah, maybe, you know, maybe we could say with Gandhi, uh, the Western state, uh, you know, that uh, it's a good idea, eh? but uh, you know, uh, seeing is believing. For many, many people, uh, the the state uh, has uh, has withdrawn and uh, and is no longer absent. And the, 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 the corona farmers crisis. are really, really uh, yeah. very clear about this. Although with the whole corona crisis now, you saw that yeah. in the end the state yeah, has to take control. A return. That's yeah. definitely the, that's definitely true. And we're very, uh, you know, uh, we're only one and a half years into that. Mm. And yeah, it's an interesting question, you know, if uh, corona will provoke this return of the of the state. Because you see that classically. In times of crisis, I mean, in times of war, the state takes control of the economy gradually. And if that war is becomes all absorbing, then the state mobilizes all the resources. And so in a time of crisis too, you saw in the end the state, the state stepping in. But I wonder whether we can make it more permanent. You know, sometimes it strikes me that we very easily 
criticize China, say, oh, they are state-owned companies and, and state this, and, and ipso facto it is bad. But I'm thinking, well, not necessarily, and we tend to forget that, that you know, many, you know, all European countries uh, organized a, uh, a planned economy after the war to, to kickstart their economy. Uh, I'm not saying we have to go back to nationalizing the coal mines and so on, but, but somehow we're now at the other extreme and we're so stuck, you know. I always irritate lots of people and, and uh, I remember giving a talk for the um, America China Chamber of Commerce and when you say that, that, well, maybe the answer is not to berate China for having so many state-owned companies or not only, but also to organize our own state intervention where it's necessary. People can get very very excited, but I think it's what we need to do, especially then again at the level of Europe, create a scale um, and then intervene a lot more actively where that's necessary, would be my take, but I'm not sure whether... Yeah, your you point must of view really <laughs> inform us, because uh, tell us what, uh, what is being discussed mm. in, the, in the board of directors of uh, <laughs> banks today. M maybe just before I answer that, what I thought was very interesting in the financial crisis is that when it really came down to it, when the crisis was um, especially acute, as let's say, for instance, in Italy at some point, there was a big issue, the, the government was replaced by a technical government. I don't know if you, if you remember no. that. So, and, 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 you know, it was called, you know, and, and that was the, the solution for, for <laughs> national unity. Uh, something similar was done in Greece. And I was always wondering, so what does that say about our systems? Mm -hmm. That when really, you know, it, 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 it comes down to an existential crisis, we actually put our political system to the side and we decide that we need to all be unified because otherwise it's not going to work. And, and so how, how do we, wh what, what learning do we draw from that? So on the one hand, of course, it is very important that as, a hu as human beings, we we, we learned to express ourselves and, and we are emancipated and we don't have oppressive systems anymore that, that, that kind of prevent from, from freedom of expression to take place. But other, on the other hand, I think we need to seriously question whether freedom of expression comes through opposition. That, that is the point I'm trying to make also when I, when I want to think of a, of a system, a model of collaboration rather than of opposition. If, if, and I did that experience when, when I was uh, in the ministry. You know, sometimes a policy was defined and then you would discuss with stakeholders and, and basically behind the door some would say, you know, I actually agree with you, but outside I can't say <laughs> that. So, so I'm thinking, wh how, how does that make sense? How is that actually uh, an, an, an expression of, of someone's position? It's not. It, it, it be has become a trap. So, so in this, I and, and this is why I want to point it out, because these are the incoherences or the imperfections of a system that has a lot of good things, but on, on the other hand also has developed some aspects that are actually preventing us from, from moving on. That, that is just also maybe in, in, in questioning the model. And this is why I wonder, for instance, do we actually need a counter power? If, if and, and, and I thought it was interesting in Samuel Huntington's uh, book, A Clash of Civilizations, how it actually says, m clarifies that we have lived until now in a, let's say, history of defining ourselves by negation. So I am not you, but who am I? You know, uh, as, as you said, you know, we, mm. we, we don't want China, we don't want this, but then who are we actually? How do we now go from an, an, a state of mind where we reject what we are not to a state of mind where we, first of all, welcome who you are, but then also define proactively who we are? That seems to be quite a challenge in, in, in the way we also look at power, because it is always it has always been used as a tool to protect, a tool to reject, a tool to impose. But how can it be a tool to communicate, to develop, to construct, to build? To co so 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 I'm just trying to put all of this in, in the context also of experiences that I've made. What you now ask is a completely different subject because when the, the wha what I'm seeing now and I actually find it fascinating. This is one of the reasons why I decided to become. Uh, independent director is now the power of good governance, as you would call it. So, and, and you can look at it at a level of a financial institution or, or a country or, or any, any other sector. I don't think it's, it's specific now to, 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 to banks, but what does organizational health mean? And, you know, what does, does this, this health uh, in, an, in a non-physical term actually mean? 
who needs to do what and decide what for the whole to function in an organized, structured and healthy way. What is the role of a board of directors vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, operational management, vis-a-vis -vis every single person in that institution for the whole to work? And, and we are, of course, now w with the financial crisis, it has become much more uh, present and we are more aware of it. What is the role of that entity up there that you know, is in charge of policy and strategy and, 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 and the financial performance of an institution? What have they been doing until now? <laughs> and how can they now take on that responsibility they have and actually really steer the boat? And, and, and what kind of a power is that? And how do you construct that power in a way that it is also legitimate and it's uh, reality connected? Because one of the problems that we often have when we talk about power is that we, we also feel that those who have power don't necessarily understand reality. <laughs> they are not in the field. Then they, they are not close to the needs of, 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 uh, of society, of a bank, etc. So I think also there, that concept of power is being redefined but in a context of how does the collective work. And of course in a bank, y you have everyone has one objective uh, in, in, in any company that would be the case. It's, it's, it's survival, it's, it's performance, it's making sure uh, that entity is doing well. And how can all the protagonists in this governance model actually contribute to that and not just some parts and, and, and others basically just have the power but don't ex exercise that responsibility in a, in, a, in a wise way. So also in that sphere, this concept is being completely redefined. But is that uh, because of pressure from outside? Do you think this good governance is a response, let's say, to, um, well, Let's uh, talk about LuxLeaks. Uh, let's talk about the Panama Papers and uh, oh. the recent uh, Pandora Papers. I mean, there um, uh, and uh, you know, if you uh, open any of them, there are uh, numerous uh, you know references to, uh, in fact, the place where we are now, to Luxembourg, uh, also to the Netherlands, of course. Uh, you know the. the um <coughs> the discussions uh, uh, in the Netherlands are uh, you know on the same uh, level mm -hmm. uh, belasting paradise uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah sure. i mean uh, or narco state mm -hmm. uh, narco state which is kind of uh, you know the next uh, chapter uh, of that mm -hmm. um so no, not uh, not just a taxation uh, heaven but um uh, in fact uh, an active uh, involvement in um, you know in illicit uh, uh, money laundering and um, mm. um, is do, do you feel that pressure and, and is it uh, PR related or would you say it goes beyond uh, uh, the image no it definitely goes beyond I mean concretely uh, if you look at how the financial ecosystem has has evolved you have regulators that are now very uh, deeply looking into into the inner life of financial institutions to see how are they doing their business, how clean is that business, are they uh, complying uh, with with regulation, etc. So th th there is a lot at stake. Then then the question is who's responsible for that? And I think as our concept of responsibility and liability has developed over the past years, so also have this has this governance model had to to evolve uh, 10 years ago sitting on the board of directors of a bank meant something completely different than today you actually today feel very responsible and sometimes people tell me but are you crazy to do that because you are you going to be liable for for what is happening in that bank and do you have the tools to 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 be liable, to, to to know what is happening in a bank so i think our understanding of what it means and to have a governance model that acts responsibly is, is evolving because of the context that you mentioned. And public opinion wants that. But, but, but what's, the, what's the issue at stake? What's the deeper root of, of that phenomenon? And, and it, it goes to a certain expectation of ethical behavior in the world of finance, but also vis-a-vis -vis people that are considered to be wealthy and rich. You know, and then and then we're very close to the concept of social justice. You know, what do I consider to be just or not just? Is it fair that you pay your taxes here and someone else pays his taxes elsewhere? Uh, what does transparency mean? 
wha what, what does it mean to, to, to actually uh, establish an, an, a concept of, of finance that is ethical? You know, I, I am a lawyer, so I, I am naturally attracted to laws and regulation. But I have to say, the amount of regulation that had to be put in place to regulate human behavior, I wonder, is that really necessary? Is that the only tool we have to suggest that some things need to be done in a very ethical way? Is there no other framework that we can think of than the regulatory framework? What happened to, to you know, a common uh, set of principles in society? You know, if, if we all had the same concept of, um, of, uh, of, let's say, you know, paying our taxes like every <laughs> citizen would, we wouldn't need to have all this regulation. And I'm just picking one. I'm, I'm not even mm. talking about financial crime, like, like mm. money laundering and, and financing of terrorism as, and fraud, etc. I mean, those are extreme things. But this here, this, this tax transparency concept, is something that affects every single person. It is a much broader issue. This is where, where everyone has an opinion about. We're not talking about just a few crim criminals that are going around and that are a, a, a select group of, of, of people. I think it leads you back, you already mentioned here, to talk about the labor movement and if it leads you back to the very beginning of the labor movement in the 19th century, where what they asked was regulation, laws, because it's the laws that create the freedom and I fear it's, it's not realistic to think that, that the common sense of purpose or values will be sufficient because you always have people who will be then driven by selfish selfish motivations you know so where you have um, yeah where you have laws then um, then it actually creates power for those who operate within the regulated system I would say um, so you have to know what society you want when I teach about strategy I always say rule number one of writing strategy is know yourself you know who do I want to be which kind of society do I do I want to be? Because if you don't know that, you also don't know what you're defending, actually, you know, or, or what you are what you are promoting, what you're trying to export. So you have to know that yourself. And then I would say what what distinguishes let the, the way of life that we've built within the EU, broadly speaking, and for me, the key notion is equality. Of course, not total equality. So it doesn't mean everybody has to have the, the exact same level of prosperity. But but equality in terms of everybody participates in political decision making, everybody has equal opportunity to be educated, um, everybody uh, is equally protected by the state, um, but and everybody gets a fair enough share of prosperity so that he and she can really take part in society in 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 the way they want. I think for me that notion of equality ought to be. The, the principle that that binds us and that maybe provides an ethical the ethical dimension that you refer to that inspires regulation but it seems to me that we've become afraid of saying that that or that we, we push it aside a little bit as if equality is a luxury product it's nice to have when things are going well but when you're in crisis and you sacrifice it or I would say no the, the other way around the point is equality and the worse things go the more you must ma maintain it, right? And um, um, I, I, we already talked about the, the European project that is sort of an, an, a peace project, you know, keep war out of Europe. But for me, that was always only ever half of it because it's the same uh, founding uh, fathers of the Union who also built the welfare state after the Second World War. And for me, the two went hand in hand. You make sure there is no war among the states and to keep the state stable internally we had the welfare state. I think those two, peace and equality, I would say that's the core of who we are as, as Europeans. And again, you need power to implement it and to enforce it and to safeguard it from any external threats. And don't be too shy about it, I would say. I, I would almost dare to say don't be too American uh, about it. Yeah, I would like to bring in a, a term we haven't really um, uh, talked about yet, and that's the term uh, that is associated with power from the very beginning. 
namely sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And of course, there is uh, sovereignty on, on many different uh, levels, right? But I'm not so interested in the, let's say, the classic definition of the uh, of the king and queen and monarchy, or uh, you know, this kind of um, very traditional uh, political definition of sovereignty. I think today uh, there are uh, different manifestations, uh, and I would say, uh, and, and many have uh, pointed at that, especially in the COVID crisis, right? There was a lack of European sovereignty, right? Uh, it, it couldn't produce uh, its own things. Uh, it had outsourced uh, uh, all its uh, production elsewhere in the world. Um, and um, many, many people were kind of longing for, mm, for a, a, a redefinition of uh, fields in which you know we were uh, in charge uh, and we uh, were able to let's say uh, you know produce uh, the vital goods and uh, services uh, that uh, were uh, required and uh, of course uh, yeah especially in my fields we know uh, you know there's not just um, China that's now the the global factory uh, there's also something like uh, you know outsourcing yeah? Uh, especially also very strong in, uh, in the financial uh, sector uh, of um, a lot of work that is being done uh, in fact uh, elsewhere outside uh, of, uh, mm. uh, of the EU and uh, the it is, the is this uh, kind of lack of sovereignty that uh, very often leads to uh, a feeling of insecurity, of uh, precarity, of um, um feeling of um, you know financial in insecurity and uh, my question really is does it make sense uh, to reintroduce this idea of a sphere of sovereignty for instance you know in your uh, field of finance or in your field um, the of, uh, the let's say the military uh, and uh, foreign policy uh, levels because on the technical uh, technological and internet level the answer is straight out uh, yes mm -hmm. we need data sovereignty in Europe we need uh, uh, tech sovereignty also on the level of uh, data centers hardware you name it let's start this enormous debate um, on the EU about strategic autonomy because um, sovereignty I would say has two dimensions you have the capacity to take your own decisions, and the capacity to implement implement on yourself also. And in many areas, we're lacking that, right? And so you need to pool your sovereignty in a way at a European level in many areas to, to regain it. Um, and the military field is, is the example par excellence. Right? If I look at my country, Belgium, okay, we can in all freedom uh, decide not to do something in the military field. But if you want to actually do something, then you realize... Belgium alone, there's only one military operation that we can do strictly by ourselves. That's the annual National Day Parade. We don't need anybody. We just need people to come and watch it. That's it. So you're sovereign in the sense you take your own decision, but you're not sovereign in the sense that you have no strategic autonomy. You cannot implement them. The answer is to pool it. But then, strangely, you hit um, uh, nationalism again. Um, and I think sometimes the EU has made a mistake by presenting itself as a post-national project. And we said, you know, uh, to, be, uh, uh, to feel Polish or to feel French, that's old-fashioned. You should forget about it. Um, but, but it's strong. It's there. You can't wish it away. It's a strong emotion. Perhaps not in Belgium. You know, the Belgians are the least... Um, patriotic because but because we're all unpatriotic together that still makes us patriotic somehow um, anyway that's another, that's another discussion maybe we should have said you know as EU by all means uh, be not a be don't be a nationalist because nationalist is more negative for it it's me against somebody else be a patriot it's me for a project so be a Polish patriot be a French patriot but it's no longer enough so in addition be a European patriot and, and do at that level, create a sovereignty at a level where you can exercise it, right? And the EU has the principle of subsidiarity, the lowest possible level, fine. You don't need to bring 
everything together in, 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 in Brussels. Um, but think about it, you know, that uh, you may be a Polish patriot or a French patriot, and so you may think you know, to gain power back from the EU, but you know, gaining stuff back from the EU probably means opening the road for China. Maybe not the best way. So, so maybe European sovereignty is indeed what, what we need in many areas. I would entirely agree. This also leads to the question, you know, if we need to uh, re-industrialize Europe mm -hmm. uh, away, mm -hmm. maybe I'm, I'm looking at you uh, away from the financial services or, or you know, maybe uh, finance with a purpose or, you know, where and, and that debate, of course, is, uh, is strong when we're uh, bringing in uh, climate change and uh, and all the, you know, cat catastrophes uh, ahead. Uh, where people ask the question, you know, uh, can finance, uh, you know, play a positive role uh, there uh, in, 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 in this uh, very, very urgent um, uh, transition uh, that, we, um, that we need to uh, somehow uh, you know, organize. Uh, and um, uh can this go hand in hand, for instance, with a reindustrialization of Europe, uh, uh, or uh, or is this uh, a project that we simply have to uh, have to forget uh, about and um, and uh, accept uh, that, uh, for instance, China is the um, is the is the global factory, uh, and uh, you know that w we will not. Uh, have anything uh, to say anymore uh, about that specific part of um, of our lives of uh, society it's an interesting question i uh, i just just to come back to the word that you used earlier sovereignty and and trying to understand it in in maybe in a new way in this context it's it is very close to what i called earlier just taking responsibility again um, and and it's not it's not an exclusive thing it's not because I'm sovereign that you can't be sovereign so I think it's also interesting to, to think again of of how sovereignties because I think that the the, the sovereign nation state is is the, the most efficient uh, a system that we have developed but you know how can we still perfect it and how can we create a model of sovereignties again that um, that uh, that that take responsibility, because I think what what is what is sometimes misunderstood is, and you you, m you talked about layers, is that you know things are not necessarily dichotomies; they can coexist. You know, I can be mm. sovereign, you can be sovereign, and there cannot be another layer of sovereignty uh, above as well. You know, we can be part of the European Union and the UN and be sovereign states. You know, th that, that collaborative system does not exclude does w that one has the possibility to, to decide and, and do things. It just creates a framework for that. That's, that's what it uh, fundamentally does. So I, I, I think to, to put it back into a context of, of giving power back somehow, where we think that we don't have power anymore, and I think it's wrong to think that. I think, in fact, you know, sometimes it's also maybe just an excuse not to take responsibility, you know, to blame it on, on someone else doing something. You know, I mean, there are many different reasons why, why both uh, states and, and, and people do or don't, don't do things. So I, I, I very much like this idea of, of uh, connecting uh, this, this concept in a, in a new way to power and to responsibility as, uh, as, as, as one coherent framework. You mentioned um, the role of finance in this context. I mean, you you know that the in the EU we talk about green finance now c c quite a lot, and the European Commission has put forward actually a, a great deal of regulation, very dense, uh, very detailed, and and that this will be a huge workload for the financial sector to implement. Um, so so there is that that awareness that also policies need to be coherent you know and this has been for instance one of the challenges uh, at the european level you know you have the policy for this and a policy for that and and another policy so you have now policies that are starting to converge you know when you talk about the environment we cannot not talk about mm. finance because <laughs> it's one of the tools 
So I, and, and I think that is a positive thing. Again, it doesn't take away from the validity, autonomy of a policy. It just creates it in a, in a larger context. On a very, very different subject, um, I've been following a little bit uh, how the policy on migration is also evolving. And interesting enough, uh, there has been an effort now to link it to a policy on agriculture. It and, and it wasn't done until now. So also creating this coherence between policies makes the policies much more powerful. Because if we start seeing how they impact each other, we can create a coherence that makes them all much more effective. So I see also in that approach <laughs> actually something very powerful and I think that we need to pursue it a lot more because we do create inco incoherences in, in, in the way we approach certain subjects and we're realizing that this is impossible to do and the fact that we have now really also coined this concept of, of green finance with all the detail that's in it uh, is a very interesting step in, in absolutely the right direction. Can you maybe split it up a little bit? Because um, green finance to me sounds a bit like, uh, well, the banking sector itself needs to uh, become more energy uh, efficient. And um, it's more about know, products. Yeah. So, so uh, what, what products do you invest not in? That, yeah. No, it's also that. Of course, also, you know, financial institutions need to look at their own. Uh, use uh, and 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 uh, investments, but then it's 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 also about the product offer that you develop, uh, and and that you uh, offer, and then what what uh, are you going to focus on? And of course, also uh, uh, investment in the environment has very many different degrees. And mm. You know, uh, d d you know, d d and and what do you look like? A company can invest in different areas. Uh, what percentage do I need to consider, you know? Um, I mean, with all the discussions that we have also about energy, you know, I mean, there is a transition that you want to also respect that, con that, that, that an industry is also trying to adapt to, to new sources of energy. So how do does the world of finance accompany that transition by focusing on the products that actually promote a certain type of energy. It's, it's not an easy, it's not an easy solution, a decision. And, it, and, and I'm very, uh, and it's the beginning of it. So this is happening right now, uh, where banks are, are, are reconsidering their product offer, reconsidering their own approach, and deciding their level of ambition. Uh, we also talk about ESG. Um, which has the E for environment, the S for social, the G for governance. It's part of that thinking of how some elements of our policies are interconnected, that we cannot, uh, and, and I had an interesting uh, discussion with a bank, in fact, uh, uh, in Russia, that said that if we now pull out of this type of energy, we will create a social crisis. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that cannot be good, especially not in the short term. It, m it might be necessary to consider that, but then how can we create transitions where we allow for her, a whole industry to adapt uh, its, its, uh, its, um, its approach? This is why I, I point out this question of coherence, because you can create undesired <laughs> side effects that are actually not really side effects that can have a huge well impact. Well, remember, you know, th this is one of the uh, <laughs> dogmas of uh, Silicon Valley, right? And uh, this has been uh, uh, very, very big. Uh, in fact, hegemonic in, in all business literature uh, to preach uh, the disruption. Yeah. And uh, disruption has been, uh, you know, the, the, the key word uh, of the last uh, 10, 15 uh, years. So why mm -hmm. not uh, disrupt uh, the energy sector? You know, tell me. Hmm? Uh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, sorry, uh, but this is uh, this has been, uh, you know, what uh, has been driving, uh, let's say, venture capital-led um, uh, investments for mm. for a really long time. The idea was consciously uh, to uh, to uh, let's say accelerate. Uh, the uh, you know the disruption of entire societies mm -hmm. and social structures. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Your Russia example is interesting because it goes to show that that uh, one is sometimes afraid of having two powerful neighbors, 
but we're also worried about neighbors that lose so much power that they implode, which creates problems of its own, right? Mm -hmm. And again, it leads you back mm -hmm. to someone has to be in charge mm -hmm. somewhere, ideally the state, um, in order to keep things stable and maybe somewhat mm -hmm. predictable. And sometimes uh, maybe we wonder whether we're not all powerless in the face of the big global challenges. Um, we talk just talked about migration, which would be an enormous um, challenge, especially for Europe, I think. Um, demographics, economic development mm. in, in depopulation, Africa. Maybe. Depopulation. Yep. And climate, of course. Um, but to me, at the same time, it reinforces me in my idea that still, therefore, states remain important and great power politics remains vital because it will be very difficult to effectively tackle any of those if you don't have the big players with you. You know, you're not going to tackle climate change if China says, well, we don't care. Um, no, luckily they begin to care if only for the domestic reasons and the CCP wants to stay in power. Mm. But so maybe this is a story I tell myself and then while everybody is working on new topics like climate, I work on old fashioned topics like geopolitics and great powers. Um, Maybe one topic that we really haven't tackled um, is the most absolute use of power is, is to make war and to kill somebody. And it's a very sensitive one, of course. And is this an instrument that we Europeans, that we still need and that, uh, that we occasionally need to deploy outside our borders? You know, and if so, under which circumstances? Um, it's a very tricky debate, you know. My line is always, we need, as Europeans, a, a credible <laughs> power projection capacity, the capacity to project force into our periphery, um, but to use it as little as we can. But if you don't have it, which is the case today, then other players will not take us into account, because they will say, well, whatever we do, the Europeans, they, they, will, they will not interfere. So occasionally they cross our red lines, and we are obliged to intervene, but we're not well prepared for it. Whereas I think if we would have a more credible capacity, but also a credible will to use it, um, some of the actors around us would, would maybe take us more into account. Um, but what are the red lines? Very tricky question. Our discourse is always the same. If we do occasionally use military force outside our borders, somehow we always feel obliged it's because it's because we're bringing democracy and human rights but a that's not true usually we that's usually that's a side effect of an intervention but but it's rarely the only reason why we deploy somewhere we go somewhere because our interests are threatened two the risk is that if you declare every war to be a war for democracy and human rights that every war becomes a war without ends without end, because, you know, when will a place like Mali, for example, ever be democratic enough to pull out, you know? Or you end up in the situation in Afghanistan, you pull out after 20 years and you go exactly back to the status quo ante, exactly to where we, uh, we were. So it's a tricky debate for Europe, because as we already mentioned a few times now, the EU per se is a peace project, but it's about peace among ourselves. But there is no peace everywhere around us, so do we still need the capacity to make war when it is forced upon us, so to say? Yeah, from my perspective, of course, there is uh, the cyber war, mm -hmm. cyber warfare, uh, you know, which is now an integral part yes. of um, of the internet business. And um, yes, uh, th there are uh, you know the very harmful, uh, let's say. Uh, Militarized uh, drones, but uh, you know there's also uh, another type uh, of uh, economic warfare uh, with uh, ransomware. Uh, it's a whole spectrum, in, in fact, uh, which uh, uh, is happening and which is kind of replacing the old um, Cold War uh, techniques. So um, the Cold War was uh, usually done with uh, espionage and uh, with uh, of course, a, a great deal of uh, propaganda and um, uh, occasionally, of course, also, uh, in fact, uh, real warfare. Mm -hmm. uh, um, maybe not uh, in the center of Europe, but, uh, but elsewhere. And uh, this is kind of what, uh, what, what I s 
what I see uh, happening. Uh, the, the definitely the war theater, uh, you know, is uh, is uh, changing. Uh, but I, would I would not say that it replaces it. I think it just added to it. And all the other stuff is also still happening. And classically, what you see, let's compare the people. You know, f first we just fought wars on land. Then we learn how to sail. We had to fight wars on sea. Then we discovered the we invented the airplane. We began to make war from the air. In the beginning, you always have people get the air theories of the 1920s. So oh, uh, the future war will be fought only from the air. No, you still fight it on sea and on land as well. And I think now it's the same. You, uh, it, it's another dimension now. Cyber is there, and so we begin to make war in cyber. But it's added to all the rest, and it makes it, of course, very expensive for states because. For example, the Belgian Armed Forces has obviously an Army, Navy, and Air Force. All the Minister of Defense decided to create this kind of cyber force, um, and so it. May but but the old techniques sadly don't don't disappear. I fear, and the espionage is still certainly Brussels is often called the uh, espionage capital of Europe because everybody is there, and so all the spies are there. Yeah, but the warfare, yeah, I mean, uh, I am often uh, think about uh, this uh, case. I, uh, I have good friends uh, in Taiwan, and uh, this is very much on my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you read a little bit about uh, the debates currently happening in the U.S. And, uh, will we go, uh, you know, f into uh, war? For uh, for Taiwan and what 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 is it, is it worth uh, World War Three uh, to um, defend that um, particular island uh, and what are the uh, you know what are the uh, the stakes uh, in fact and I think that will be with us uh, uh, for uh, you know the next uh, couple of uh, years when we're talking about military power. I think the, the 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 Taiwan test case is going to uh, be uh, quite an uh, an interesting one because a, l a lot of people say that the West will not really care uh, about Taiwan, right? And so, what what does that mean? What what does it mean that we don't really care? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm quite intrigued uh, about that. We care, but not at any price. Uh, it's an issue I follow because my husband is from Taiwan, actually. Mm. So, um, and I think few people on Taiwan itself expect that the US would go to war with China when push comes to shove. Um, but what we could signal, I think, is that if, if China were to, let's say, change the status quo by force of arms, it would totally change our relations with China. Because, I mean, my point of view is China is a great power. That's normal, given its size, given its history. It would be strange if it were not a great power. In itself, it's not problematic. It depends what they do with that power. If they use their power more or less within the rules of the game, then I think we will can and will have to live with China. But if they decide to become an aggressive military power, then we ought to say, well, we cannot have any economic relations with you. I think the regime in Beijing has to realize it would be an enormous gamble uh, to, to put all of that on the line. So then the economic dimension of power mm. comes into it. But the question is, will we? Because when Russia invaded Ukraine and, and took away the Crimea, mm. did we then cancel our economic relations or with Russia? No, uh, mm. but because we, we applied sanctions against Russia, but carefully isolated the energy sector because of the mutual dependence. So. Then again, you say, yeah, well, the Crimea, they speak Russian anyway, it's been Russian before. And, and this is how some people may also react about Taiwan, yeah, they speak ta uh, Belarus, Chinese anyway, that matter, the or Belarus. Crisis there. Um, I'm wondering, uh, can you say something about the presence of Chinese banks? Uh, it's very obvious <laughs> here in uh, Luxembourg, they are very uh, present here. At the same time, uh, the Chinese banking sector is also uh, Facing massive problems, uh, you know, with debt, not just only in the, in the real estate sector, but um, how do you look at this this kind of uh, model of uh, you know debt-driven banking? W what do you make of that? That's an interesting concept, debt 
driven banking. I think that is a, a, a global phenomenon. Uh, this is the way our financial economic system is built. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right to say that the, the level of debt is, is huge, but not just in China. Uh, truly, if, if, you, if you look at, 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 at the European market, uh, and not just public debt, but also private debt, it, it is absolutely huge. Um, what, uh, what do I say about Chinese banks in Europe? Well, it's an interesting market. Uh, Chinese banks want to, to be in Europe, and, and, and not just them, other banks as well. And Luxembourg uh, is, is often considered as a, as a headquarter uh, a place uh, to, to, to be able to, to do banking in, in, in Europe. So as such, it is absolutely natural uh, and normal that you would find so many Chinese banks, but also other banks, Swiss banks, um, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in, in Luxembourg to be able to, to to organize and coordinate um, banking activities within the EU market from 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 Luxembourg. So this is uh, this is why why they're here, and we're quite happy they're here. Um, Can you join a board of a Chinese bank? Well, as a matter of fact, I am on the board of a Chinese bank. <laughs> <laughs> I am on the board of uh, ICBC Europe SA. Uh, which is the headquarter structure for the branches uh, in in, uh, in the EU, and uh, and it's quite interesting to 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 work at that level uh, of the of the board of directors to understand the Chinese approach to to banking, to also understand how their strategies develop, um, how they do take interest in the domestic markets. Uh, they do want to be part also of the economic reality of the countries that they're in. It's not just about Chinese business, it's also about domestic business. And this is a strategy that I have seen is developing very recently. So, um, And is it, a, let's say, a, a traditional Shanghai-based industrial bank? Or what, what type of uh, bank is it? Yeah. Well, ICBC is, in fact, the largest bank in the world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but... It is, uh, it is uh, of course, uh, like, awesome. like most, uh, yeah. most uh, Chinese banks, the stained old bank. Yeah. Maybe a final question. Um, what, what power do the three of us think that we each have as an individual? What power do we have, if any? Not much, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> no, in fact, I think this is, uh, this is the most relevant question. Because at the end of the day, the question I ask myself is, what can I do? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is a question, I mean, I used the word earlier on of empowerment that uh, I like very much and that I find, in fact, a much more modern concept of power than, than maybe what we, what we are used to. And as an individual, I need to ask myself, how can I make a contribution every single day to, this, to the betterment of the world for things to improve? And what is my, let's say, sphere of, of influence? W what can I influence? You know? and, and at the end of the day, it's the sum of a lot of actions in the world that will make a difference, that will make us go into one or the other direction. So as a, as a human being, uh, as a mother, as, as a friend, as, as, as just simply a woman also in, an, in, in a society, where we have uh, still no full equality between uh, men and women. I mean, these are all the dynam dimensions of an identity that one, one needs to explore, needs to be aware of, and then really think, so what is my very valuable and unique contribution today uh, in this society for us to move uh, a step forward? And of course, everyone has a different answer to that question, but this is today what defines me as a human being to be able to understand how I can be of service to the betterment of the world. That for me is the, the most uh, uh, powerful uh, uh, state of mind that I can imagine. Geert. Yeah, I think to design and promote uh, critical concepts, I think that's a very, uh, you know, a very deeply uh, European um, trait. And uh, I think, um, uh, well, we're in a, a contemporary art museum here, and um, 
you know, if we follow Ezra Pound's idea of art as the uh, antenna of the human race, uh, it's really, uh, you know, my task uh, to work with artists and uh, many others to develop those concepts, critical concepts that, in my view, you know, question and dismantle uh, the powers to be and uh, envision, uh, you know, other worlds. Um, yeah, so there's always a speculative element in the concept um, and um, in my uh, case always also a critical one. Yeah, yeah. Well, myself, uh, one would wish, you know, as a think tanker, a think tank in Brussels, that you have great power to influence the decision makers, but I'm very, very pragmatic about it. I think occasionally, from time to time, you have a powerful idea between big brackets that resonates and then sort of begins to circulate of itself. But I've never seen it happen that think tanker A comes up with an idea which leads directly to a decision B. But I say if you have a good idea, it becomes part of the context within which the decision maker decides. Um, so I think the most power that is the word that I have is, is my teaching. I mean, I like to teach, so it's fun, but, but, but this is teaching and uh, sort of uh, hopefully pushing people to think for themselves. What I also like a lot is not just teaching uh, my Belgian students, but to teach international students. Eh? And for example, I think the, um, the last thing we should do is to close academic and cultural exchange because think of a Russian or a Chinese student who spends a semester or a year um, in, in, in Belgium, the Netherlands or Luxembourg, um, uh, she will have lived in another system for an entire year. And of course, we'll not go back as a revolutionary, but we'll have a, you know, a very, hopefully a much more nuanced, nuanced view. So I think teaching and, and, and then exchanging um, remains very powerful. and. Uh, and very important. Maybe, maybe an additional thought to that. I think as human beings we have one power that distinguishes us from everything else in this world. It's a power to reason. Mm. And it's really a capacity that, that we need to develop far more, and especially in a consumer society where we are trained to be passive. It is a, <laughs> a double challenge to use this power to reason. But I like this this uh, statement of Einstein, I don't actually know if he said it or not, but I like it anyways, where he said when we solve problems, we cannot use the same thinking we use and we created them. And I think this yeah. is something that we <coughs> really need to uh, assimilate, that when we look at reality today and, 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 and we want to make changes, we need to challenge ourselves in our assumptions, in our definitions, and, and have that capacity to rethink a completely different reality. And I think we have that capacity and sometimes we don't use it to the fullest. And this would be something that I would at least hope for that is a power that we would collectively use far more. Here, here. I think we can end on that very positive note. Thank, thank you, Sarah, you. and thank you, Hirt. Thank you, thank you both of you.